Hi, I'm Joy Bardowell. Welcome once again to Truth Unraveled. Today I'll be looking at laying the foundation for understanding uh, condemnation through being marked on the forehead as well as as it relates to being numbered. But most people don't realize that this concept is really God's concept in the first place as it relates to redemption. So today's study will be looking at the two different segments as being marked by the Lord and the mark in the forehead for those who are God's people and their numbering. And um, what I want to say to you is this, that all the studies that I've put up so far, whether it was to do with Boaz and Ruth or understanding those who are Babylonians, they're not Israelites, everything goes together to understanding prophecy and end times especially as it relates to the book of Revelation. So I'd advise you, those of you who are trying to pick and choose parts of what to listen to, that you do not do that. Do not overlook anything that you've seen because it will help you greatly in understanding what I am about to teach concerning the book of Revelation. So uh, with that in mind, let us have a short word of prayer. Father in heaven, cause the knowledge of your truth to be in us and with us that we may live by your spirit your life-giving spirit may your wisdom water the depth of our being that we may flourish as one that grows beside the abundance of waters so that we may be yielding the abundance of the grain that you sow in your field this world as I give you thanks in your holy and precious name I pray amen now, in part one, I began in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2, and I'll be going into chapter 2, verse 3 today. I have already done verse 2 extensively, and this is what we have. Uh, let me just review verse 2 and then move right into verse 3. Now, before I begin today's study, there's a point I want to make because that is needed. I'm going to be focusing on Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2 and verse 3. I've already done some of it in the previous study, but I'm going to be filling in the details today. One of the things you need to recognize is when you read in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 2, and it speaks of her being a bride, the focus is on after she left Egypt and was at Mount Sinai, and God signed that marriage contract, that marriage covenant with her. But Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 3 that speaks of her being the first fruit of his increase is a looking back to when she was actually in Egypt itself where God said to Moses to tell Pharaoh go and tell Pharaoh let my people go that they may serve me which means worship me and that verse immediately after that he says for Israel is my firstborn son. Now, the first fruit of his increase, that's what he's referring to, therefore. The first fruit of increase is about being the firstborn son. So, I just wanted to clarify that before I begin the study. So, one is a looking after, which is verse 2, and one is a looking before she left Egypt. That's verse 3. So it's like the reverse. That's how the Bible is sometimes written. You, the, the writers tell you something that's going to happen after and then when you think that you have been progressing it takes you back to look what happened before. And that's the same thing. You're going to find a lot of that in the book of Revelation as a matter of fact. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 2 says this, Go and shout this in Jerusalem street. The Lord says, I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago, and how you loved me and followed me even through barren deserts. The Revised Standard says, I remember the devotion of your youth and the love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Notice, God wants Jer Jer Jeremiah to shout it, as if to say, remember? But he says, I want you to remember, because I remember. He said, I remember. I want you to remember. You see, because he, he was her husband, and he wants her to remember the love, the passion that she had for him, and the love that he had for her, the relationship they had. Now, I had 
gone through the study extensively and I've showed you that um, the best way to understand Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 2 is through Ezekiel chapter 16 that I have dealt with so much, much time going through Ezekiel 16. In fact, I haven't even finished it because I haven't left uh, showing you how she became a harlot and her restoration is not yet. I have not given that study portion of study to you. But uh, one of the things too I pointed out to you is that the whole thing about her being a bride is really about redemption because what you have to understand in biblical times in order to to take a bride to yourself the husband had to pay what is called a bride price and the word price has to do with the word buy that's where you get the word redeemed from to buy again in this case re mean to go back to and buy deem by so you see it's you have to understand the, the biblical language in now the bride price is best depicted in the scripture through the life of Ruth and her request of a man called Boaz to be her kinsman redeemer actually he was a kinsman and she wanted him to be the one to redeem her now in order to do this, however, as I put up that study already for you to understand, I went to the book of Ruth and I showed you Ruth chapter 3. She went to the threshing floor and she sought to ask him to uh, remove the covering from the edge of his cloak, which represent um, everything to do with the Ten Commandments, as I've shown you, uh, looking back at Numbers chapter 15. And then she said, the scriptures showed us through the book of uh or through the version of the Living Bible, that means she was saying, make me your wife. Now, I also pointed out to you that the threshing floor, uh, therefore, God is trying to show us that to the discussion of having a bride and to have someone redeem you as a bride, that discussion has to take place on the threshing floor. And interestingly, the threshing floor speaks of the temple because that is eventually we are going to see that David purchased the piece of land from a man by the name of Ornon and that was the threshing floor and that became the site of the actual temple of God. Now when I'm going to take you to Ruth chapter 4 you're going to discover that in order for Boaz to, to carry out this transaction to, to make Ruth his bride, he'll have to purchase the land first. He'll have to redeem the land. And he negotiated with another man who was the closer uh, king's man, but he, he refused to, to take that role when he discovered that he would have to purchase Ruth as well. And um, so what God is doing also is depicting to us that for the, the site of the temple, which is the threshing floor, because that was where t t all the discussion take place, uh, in order for him to have a bride, or should I say the purchase of the threshing floor, therefore, as we're going to discover when David purchased that land to, uh, to be the site for the temple, was God's way of saying, I am purchasing a bride through this means. And that is understandable because it is the temple is set up for sacrifice. And the sacrifice was the means of leading or to purchase people uh, by them, redeem them through the blood of Yeshua. So that's why when you get to the book of Revelation 21 verse 9, you'll read come I'll show you the wife the lamb's bride you see it's a sacrificial lamb so it has everything to do with the, the sacrifice in order to purchase uh, a bride through his blood first Corinthians six seventeen down to 20 reads but if you give yourself to the Lord you and Christ are joined together as one person. That is why I say to run from sex sins. That would have been, in other words, sexual immorality. Uh, no other sin affects the body as this one does. When you sin, this sin is against your own body. Haven't you yet learned that your body is the home of the Holy Spirit God gave you and that he lives within you? Your own body does not belong to you. For God has what? Notice this. For God has bought you with a great price. So use every part of your body to give glory back to God because he owns it. Uh, the New King James says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
notice that the the temple your body temple is a temple of the Holy Spirit it's the home of the Holy Spirit therefore it makes sense if that body is the home of the Holy Spirit that you give God glory not just in your body but in your spirit because that's how first of all the spirit is indwelling you and your spirit has to align with the Spirit of God for for that spirit to dwell there because if two do not agree then they cannot walk together the scripture tells us that so for those of us who claim to be children of God to be temples of God we need to ensure that we're living a right life and the Holy Spirit is given for one purpose only that we will be holy people unto the Lord now take a look at Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 3 now Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 3 actually presents us with two separate concepts. The part that says Israel was holy miss unto Jehovah is tied directly to the fact that she was the bride and at that point she was holy unto the Lord. But later we're going to find that um, this other portion, the part that says the first fruit of, of his increase, that word first fruit of his increase is in reference to tithing so actually what God is saying he is gonna do a tithing of his people you know this is a concept that most people don't seem to know about they know about God talking about us giving the first fruit of our increase but they never heard of God give having the first fruit of his increase and this part is what's going to help us to understand uh, the whole numbering concept in the Bible and how God numbers people and how he's going to choose them and also uh, we are going to also it's going to help us to understand the the mark of the beast 666 now what god is going to do we're going to find when you get into ezekiel 20 verse 37 and so on that god is going to pass his people under the rod to 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 bring out a small quota of which he says so that they will be uh be bound to the covenant which of course you know the covenant is the words of the covenant is the ten commandments and but when you get back to Leviticus 27 you're going to find that's 27 verse uh, 23 you're going to find that that's where you're going to get the explanation how this is done you're going to realize that the passing under the rod is the same thing that he does with the sheep they pass under the rod and one out of every ten is chosen so that is what's going to happen but I'm going to take you through those scriptures and show that to you uh, now back to the previous study recapping this portion the part that says Israel was holiness unto Jehovah I pointed out to you was related to Exodus 26 36 to sorry Exodus 28 36 to 38 so now let me take you there now before I take you to Exodus 28 I want you to consider this when God says um, Israel was holiness unto Jehovah do you think that every single person was holy unto the Lord no how who is he talking about therefore it's those that he'd pass under the rod to bind them to the covenant those are the first fruits of his increase those are the people who are really that are considered holy unto the Lord in the previous study I had shown you uh, Exodus 28 verse 36 down to 38 as the parallel to Jeremiah 2 verse 3 that says Israel was holiness unto the Lord and that is found mainly in verse 36 let us look at it again you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet uh, holiness to the Lord and you know something that is engraved it is embedded that's like uh, branding that's how you engrave then now it says and you shall put it on a blue cord that it may be on the turban it shall be on the front of the turban so it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts and it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord the living Bible had put it this way this plate is to be attached by means of a blue ribbon to the front of 
Aaron's turban. In this way, Aaron will be wearing it upon his forehead and thus bearing the guilt connected with any errors regarding the offerings of the people of Israel. It shall always be worn when he goes into the presence of the Lord so that the people will be accepted and forgiven. So it had everything to do with acceptance and forgiveness. And of course, the reason for forgiveness is because people sinned. Now, as I pointed out to you, unfortunately, this was a rule that God gave to, to uh, Jerusalem to, to, to live that life. A priestly rule. He said, I call you to be a separated people, to be a holy people, to be a royal priesthood. And instead of that, what we read in Revelation 17 5 is that she became this woman who turned out to be sinful instead of in being an intercessor of sin she became very sinful and that is what we read instead of having holiness unto the Lord on her forehead what we find is in Revelation 17 these words instead a mysterious caption was written on her forehead Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of idol worship everywhere around the world. That's how the Living Bible renders it. I'll explain that a bit. Then, Revised Standard actually used the word harlot. It says, And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations. Now, you're going to find this word abominations a lot in the Bible, especially in the book of Daniel. And, uh, also in the apocalyptic cryptics words of um, Matthew 24, Mark 13 and Luke 21. However, the part that says uh, the living Bible when it says mother of prostitutes which is the same word for harlots and idol worship everywhere around the world, you're going to find that the harlotry throughout the Bible has everything to do with worshipping other gods not the true God, that's false gods idol worship so it is a proper rendering when it says uh, of idol worship everywhere around the world because what happens is as I pointed out to you that the scripture says that Jerusalem as I showed you in the previous study you can go back there and you see the text it says Jerusalem God had set her as the center of the nations so as a center of the nations whatever she does will affect the world and the intention God had was that as his people set apart wholly unto him and under his laws following his ways they would perpetrate holiness or rather become the means of letting other nations understand the holiness of God but unfortunately as I said she became a harlot and the harlot instead of uh, being a true worshiper of God and seeking to worship him with the s in spirit and in truth she became a people that uh, started to get involved in worshiping other gods because they were instead being influenced by the nations around them rather than influencing the nations themselves they started to take on the practices of these other nations and that's what the scripture teach and of course i've shown you some of that in the scripture and i'll continue to show you to prove that this is everything about jerusalem and the temple now at this time, I'll be looking at the second portion of Jeremiah 2, verse 3, the part that says the first fruit of his increase, which I said is a looking back at her life before she left Egypt. The bride is after she be left Egypt, but uh, the, the first fruit of his increase is a looking back before she left Egypt, where God says, uh, Israel is my firstborn son. So let me take you to that verse. Exodus 4.22, God gave Moses some instructions, then he said these words, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. That word serve me means to worship me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn son. Now, 
what I want you to recall here, when God said, let my people go that they may serve me, later you're going to find him said, let, let my people go that they may worship me. At this point, there was nothing set up for worship. There was no tabernacle in the wilderness. Later, God is going to ask them to, to uh, get the tabernacle set up, but it was for the purpose of housing the laws of God when he gave them that law to them which was made at the, the covenant the laws the words of the Ten Commandments are the words of the covenant as I have shown in previous study from a text now what happens is that you're going to find that when you get to uh, Exodus thirteen twelve, that's where you're going to start getting the explanation between understanding the first fruit of his increase as Jeremiah 2 verse 3 stated as well as the firstborn son which this verse just clarified now let me take you there now before I get to Exodus thirteen twelve, there's something I want to point out regarding this verse here of uh, Exodus four twenty two. Now, this verse is the first reference to God saying uh, to, to Pharaoh through Moses, let my people go. And you're going to find that as you get to chapter 5 and beyond, you're going to find that it, it, this word, let my people go, or rather this statement, is related to another statement that God is going to say, because of this, I'm going to send on Egypt such hail such as had never been and will never see, be seen again. Now, that thing about such as had never been and will never be seen again is what I have discovered as I study throughout the Bible. You'll find that statement comes up time and time again. It is directly related to the tribulation period. So that's why you're going to find it, for instance, in Matthew 24, where you read that such a time that is going to take place had had never been and will never be again it has never been since since the, since the beginning of time so this is where it all began this whole thing about the tribulation began right here where god is speaking to pharaoh you, now there's another thing that you need to know the reason why god said let my people go is because god said i saw my people groaning and so he sent Moses to deliver them and the word deliver is as if to say deliver a child as it were that that was to be brought forth into the world now the deliverance was to take them to the promised land now the same thing is going to happen as we go through the, the Bible and look at the labor pains of Matthew 24 and so on you're going to find that labor pains throughout the Bible is described as a woman who is in travail who is groaning to bring forth her child so it's the same thing God is going to do and this time however with the labor pains that is going to be coming up that is related to tribulation itself uh, it is going to be a case of the groaning to be delivered and that groaning must take the form of praying because that's what the scripture teach and I'm going to show it to you. That is why praying is so important to, to the end times. Jesus teach that we are to pray a lot concerning end times. In fact, everything he spoke about the end times, his focus was on the need to pray see and the praying is because the holy spirit will be there groaning with us to be delivered and the, the it also says creation is groaning too also waiting for the redemption of the people of god so this is what you're going to find the major difference therefore is that though what god did is remember all of the old testament is a is a typology of what is was yet to come so what god is going to do and that is why you find all of uh exodus a lot of exodus almost all of it is the it's the imagery you'll find that in in the book of revelation all the different plagues you're going to find them in revelation as well now the explanation of the first fruit of his increase which is a tithing of the people and as it relates to the first of his children which means the firstborn sons as we've just seen in uh, exodus 4 verse 22 we're going to find that the answer to that or the explanation to those two concepts will be carried through between exodus 13 12 all the way down and in fact exodus 13 9 speaks of the brand mark on the forehead in a previous teaching i had pointed out to you that that brand mark uh is going to show you the direct opposite to what takes place in revelation 13 8 down to 16 where those who receive that mark in their forehead 
who belong to Satan, their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And um, the opposite is that those here in Exodus 13.9, which I'm going to show you again, uh, as it relates to this firstborn that we're looking at, uh, you're going to see that these people were those whom God had just mentioned, or rather pointed out the connection with the brand mark has to do with the Passover with of the Lamb that was slain. And that is important because when you look at Revelation 13, 8, it says it's those whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. That's what it's talking about. So it's quite perfect to understand that that's how you have to understand the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. But uh, there's another point here. This firstborn son that we're going to read about uh, in Exodus 13, you're going to find that it is directly linked with numbering the people. And that's why when you get to Revelation 13 as well, you read about uh, the people being, those who receive the mark of the beast, being numbered. They're numbered as well as have that mark in their forehead. So what you're finding is to understand Revelation 13, the mark of the beast being numbered and the, the, and the, the whole thing about that mark in the forehead or the brand mark in the forehead, you'll have to understand Exodus 12 to 13. Okay? If you don't understand it, then we're going to miss it. And don't forget, as I said, I'm going to point out to you without a shadow of doubt that that beast is really referring to sin. Nothing but sin. Don't let anyone fool you. It's nothing else but sin. The concept of being marked and being numbered is not something new in the Bible. It didn't just suddenly pop up in Revelation 13. It is a concept that God has for his people. And it is directly linked with the Passover, the slain of the Lamb, which points to what Christ would do when he died for us. And so it is... Th those in Revelation 13 are those who did not receive uh, the mark, who received the mark, are those who had not received Christ himself because it says their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that is, of course, the sacrificial lamb. So well, I'll have to say goodbye for now. The next time I'll be looking at the firstborn and the fact that they are to be taught the purpose for brand mark on the forehead and the feast of unleavened bread as and its relationship to the Passover, as well as paying a redemption or ransom money for atonement, which is related to numbering the people as well as to the threshing floor. So goodbye for now and may God richly bless you.